Well, it's a great delight for me to be here, and I thank you all for coming on this occasion. Um, the title, Human Development, the post-2015 era, was, I think, chosen rather rapidly between uh, Liz Grand and myself when we were looking for a title. I think they, they, for those who are wondering what exactly is 2015, well, it's the end of the the uh, the period in which the Millennium Development Goals were to be finished and the question of what, what to do after that. Now here I must say I've always had a bit of a grumble about the Millennium Development Goals, not because I don't approve of them, and indeed I do, um, but because it was the successor to something called the Millennium Declaration which preceded it. And that had an enormously bigger role it had uh, democracy, it had human rights, many other things. So anything that wasn't immediately measurable was dispensed with in the Millennium Development Goals. And there was a victory of the concreteness over foundational concerns. So it's unfortunate and I've had an opportunity speaking at the General Assembly in, in uh, last fall and trying to urge that they restitute that. And when it's renewed, they go into that. However, what I'm going to talk about today uh, actually fits in quite well with the Millennium Development Goal. That is a, the, the, the rather narrower concern. But I remind that because quite a lot of it would be concerned with some issues where one of the um, major uh, concerns and achievements of India namely running a multi-party democracy system, would not figure. Uh, and that's certainly one of our achievements. I would be contrasting China with India. And if there are positive things, indeed, I wrote something on that in the New York Review, uh, that indeed, when it comes to democracy, there are issues of which we can be proud. Not that it's perfect. There are a lot of things that can, that has indeed gone wrong. But on the other hand, um, Taking the rough with the smooth, there are our achievements are definitely quite considerable on, on uh, maintaining uh, a multi-party, thriving, functioning democracy in a very poor country with uh, many religions, many languages, many regional differences, uh, as well as many other differences of a political, social, and other kind. But I would be concerned primarily with um, human development. And here again, uh, I would um, distinguish between human development uh, in the broad sense, which includes all the things that concern us. And Mabu Bulhak, the founder, as Ajay mentioned, and I would go further than Ajay. He was not so much made a contribution. He was the architect of the human development. I helped him, make that helped him, many others helped him, but we would have got nowhere but for Mabu will have leadership. And uh, I shouldn't give a too long a speech, but I ought to perhaps say one or two things about Mabu himself on this occasion. I certainly couldn't bat, couldn't, couldn't match the admirable brevity of Liz Grant's presentation, which consisted of unveiling it and then disappearing without a word. <laughs> but I also would like to take this opportunity of welcoming Liz because she hadn't been here for very long. And we have um, many other uh, uh, concerns in common uh, in addition to uh, uh, human development, uh, including uh, our respective friendship with Eric Hopsbaum, the great historian, uh, who's a very close friend of mine, very close friend of Liz and who died only a little while ago uh, at a very advanced age. Now, um, so uh, welcome, uh, Liz, and I hope uh, you find uh, the work here uh, entertaining. I think entertaining it will be. Uh, uh, worthwhile, I hope so. <laughs> and certainly, uh, there's a huge role for the the UN to play and the UN coordination to play in this context. Um, Mabu 
introduced me, as it were, or we talked about the idea of human development when I first met him in October of 1953. I had just arrived from Calcutta Presidency College. He had just arrived from Pakistan. We arrived more or less on the same day, and we were walking towards a lecture, I think, of John Robinson. And um, uh, I think Mabu asked me whether I knew where the middle lane was, and I explained that I did. I was very well equipped by then, having spent 24 hours and walked around. And so we walked together, and this became, of course, a close friendship. But I remember spending a lot of time chatting with him already then as to why what even what Mrs. John Robinson was then teaching us, while very interesting in themselves, isn't really what we are concerned with. And I remember one of Mahbub's remarks then, that if India goes as fast as, um, as is possible, maximum possible, which of course in those days used to be rather lower than it's taken to be now, maximum possible, then in 40 years, India and Pakistan would catch up with Egypt. And he said, would that be adequate for us? Now, I would, would like to explain, Mahbub had nothing against Egypt. <laughs> but he was saying that we should be able to do spectacularly better right now and right here. So that was really the thing that drove the human development thing. And he, of course, then I stayed on for a while in Cambridge. He went to, to Pakistan. He went first to Yale, and then he went to Pakistan. And I visited him before I joined in Delhi School of Economics in the 60s. I came via uh, Lahore and, uh, and um, Karachi. And he was still concerned with it. And then, of course, bit by bit, he was exercising more power in Pakistan, but also getting more and more disillusioned. And then in 1989, I, in the summer, he called me and he said, drop everything. You have to come and help me out with the doing the human development approach. Not just human development index, that's only one part of it to which you made a reference, uh, Ajay, and that's right, that is in fact the flag shape, but in fact the approach is much broader than that, because it uh, concerns all the things that human life uh, flourishing depends on. So we, uh, uh, and I said, look, I can't drop everything. I've got PhD students, I've come teaching, I've got a job, I've got a salary, and so on. But eventually, as always, my book, of course, prevailed. So I found myself going very regularly through 89, 90, when the first human development report appeared in, in the summer of um, uh, um, 1990. I thought the human development index, I have to acknowledge, uh, has a huge role and, uh, uh, in, in, in making. Indeed, it could be said that in many ways I put the touches that made it possible. We knew what factors, to, after some argument, what factors to put together. There was a question of indexing. Mahbub did not want any indexing. Uh, you know, he didn't want any weighting, only one, one, one. And so I explained, uh, Mahbub never liked formal reasoning much. Uh, but he didn't need it because he had enormous insight in everything. So I said, look, these are three different units. So one, one, one is no more arbitrary than one, two, four, or anything else. So anyway, then we uh, got our sites together, and then we did rather interesting sensitivity analysis, changing the weights, looking at the numbers and see how they come up. And to combine plausibility in terms of other information, along with this, to arrive at the weighting. And then that, as those who would know mathematical economics would know, is done by normalization. That is, if you take the life expectancy, the bottom to be zero and top to be 100, then it gets a, each year gets a weight of one. But if you take the bottom to be the lowest at that time, let's say 50 or something, or 45, and the highest to be Japan and 85, then of course each year, get a much bigger weight. So that's the uh, so the normalization had to deal with that. Anyway, the HDI came through. The uh, I was opposed to it. I told Mahbub that it was vulgar to try to get one number. And, uh, and Mahbub at one stage told me, I mean, he kept calling me. I was then in, uh, in, in Harvard. And then my son, Kabir, came up and told me that that man is on the phone again. <laughs> and that man told me, uh, you're right, quite right, uh, Amartya. 
uh, it is vulgar. I want you to work on an index which is just as vulgar as GDP, excepting represents something of human life. And I think that drove the HDI, and then of course he had a real delight when it caught the headline everywhere. Uh, kind of places where we didn't expect headline, like Financial Times, The Economist, and so on. Um, and then of course, the human development approach prevailed and became the most widely used uh, approach indeed the HEI became the most widely used index for a while, for a long while. Now, <laughs> if you look at that, what, <coughs> what's the content of the human development approach? What does it depend on? Well, uh, there are two distinctions here to make. One is growth and development, and the other is development and human development. Now, the growth and development is an issue. Growth is about GDP or GNP, thank you, Anya. and um, it's not about human beings as such, it's about commodities. So development translate that into things connected with human life. Now, all development economics, even to start with, had been that. There was a certain amount of confusion at the beginning of development economics, like Arthur Lewis and so on. But on the other hand, even though he talked about growth, it's quite clear if you read the book carefully, he was really concerned with human uh, living. Not very clearly, but I think he was. Um, but the people like Albert Hirschman, another person who have lost only last two months ago, uh, was very clear on that. And, and so were uh, people writing in, in this country and in, and in other developing countries in the world. Now, human development puts them together in a kind of coherent whole. And the two ways the problematic differs is not that every kind of change of human life is, is a celebration, of course that is, but more than that, it tries to do a certain amount of evaluation of how important is this, how important is that. So here, human, human beings come in in terms of also our evaluative faculties. There's no way of escaping that. And when people say, well, GDP is great, you don't have to make any value judgment. What it means is that you're accepting the value judgment that the market makes for you. Whereas human development is saying that you make it yourself. Explain to me why is life expectancy this important? Why is female education that important? And so forth. So it converts a mechanical exercise into a cognitive and evaluative exercise. And it also addresses the difficult issue of how development and growth are related. Now here's a point to note that human development has got nothing to nothing against economic growth whatsoever. In fact, of the three indicators that make up the HDI, one of them is in fact GDP per capita up to a certain level. Beyond that we don't worry about that. All that was in fact entirely aimed at developing countries, though it was used quite a bit to make comparison within Europe. Mavu was extremely pleased and he called me up when he said that the Canadian Prime Minister had made an election statement saying he couldn't understand how the opposition can expect to get any vote at all given the fact that Canada was at the top of the HDI league. And Mavu summarized this observation by saying clearly we have won. So I think that was a kind of visibility of a result that he's looking at, but he was also pointing to the fact that the kind of weighting that has emerged in the human development approach is getting more and more accepted. On the other hand, human development may, may be extremely um, keen on economic growth. I have been writing most things, uh, mostly what I've been writing on on practical matters, leaving our field theory research last year had been about Europe and the catastrophic error that Europe made in selling growth down the drain, overlooking the fact that you cannot pay back the debt without a high growth economy. I mean, high growth generates resources. The question, in India, the question is, how are we using the resources? What purpose? In what kind of advancement of human life? When we cannot um, uh, justify that, there is a failure of a human development engagement. But when you're not generating any growth at all and just asking people to cut this and cut that, 
with Europe had gone on again and again and not got anywhere, as indeed would have been predicted, even on Keynesian reasoning, but there are many other reasoning, including that of Adam Smith, uh, as to why you have to take a broader view of, of, of human society and development to understand the engagements involved. Contrary to uh, Smith's image as a no-nonsense marketeer, of course he was always a great believer in state's role in developing in those things uh, that the state can do. Indeed, he said, the reason why we need good political economy is because it helps to generate um, uh, development by which he meant uh, growth of a kind that would improve the life of human beings and also generate resources for the government to spend those things which only the public sector can uh, can can uh, can do, and I quoted that, of course, also in my lecturing to Europe. So I think that that was a context in which the neglect of growth is perhaps the biggest failure of human development. So the idea that there's a kind of contradiction between them is quite ridiculous. It, it you know it only point that that Mabu was making is that growth is not valuable on its own when it's essential and needed, then to slacken on it would be a very bad pursuit of human development. And when it's not in essential, uh, but uh, when it's absolutely only thing you're doing and not using the resources for any other purpose that enhances human life, well then it's a different kind of criticism. I think Europe has gone into that, and I have to say to the credit of India, it actually did not fall for that. India did not, China didn't. Um, Britain, which was not part of the euro and did not have any reason to pursue that, nevertheless pursued it. It's never been quite clear why they chose the painful part of cutting everything, especially since John Maynard Keynes was actually born in Eng England, uh, that, that that would somehow generate uh, a, a budget surplus, uh, which of course it didn't generate as predicted, and they continue to believe it will now. It hasn't in two years, but now it will. Uh, this is the greatest folly of all, of which actually Adam Smith also speaks, namely inability to learn from experience and expect that even though everything is much the same as in the past, it will now generate a different result, which it hasn't, of course. I won't go indulge in anti-English uh, um, uh, statements of people like George Bernard Shaw, uh, in Man and Superman, when I think Anne Tanner says that an Englishman feels moral only when he is merely uncomfortable. Uh, and I think, that, I think that's probably a psychologically unfair statement to make. Uh, on the other hand, it's not easy to find an explanation. It's certainly not easy to find an explanation within economics of what has been going on. Now, in terms of the situation in India what, uh, and, and in, the, in the developing world, what's been happening. India has had high rates of growth. It is uh, weakened a bit. Uh, but, you know, we have to put that in perspective. I think in, in, uh, in last week of June, last year, I got two phone calls one morning. One was from a French paper asking me that, have you seen the last quarter Eurozone figure, and I said, no, I haven't, what's happened? He said, it stopped sinking. The Eurozone had zero growth rate. Is it not a moment for congratulation? I said, well, it probably is. Let me think about that. He said, could you give an interview? I said, well, it depends. I have to fit it in. Two hours later, I got a call from a television think channel here, in fact, NDTV, saying, what have I got to say about the disastrous figure on economic growth, dismal figure? So I said, how dismal is dismal? And they said, oh, really dismal. It's 6.2% growth rate. <laughs> so I had to take the two remarks together and wondered which interview I ought to give. In the event, I think I don't give either. I think I may have answered a couple of questions of NDTV. But the, the issue here is to understand the role of growth. And I think the, uh, the, you know, there's no question that 
to raise the rate of growth in India would be a good thing, absolutely. And there are ways of doing it. And indeed, the government can do it. And indeed, the public can do it too, to help in that. This is a big project. On the other hand, it's also very important to see, A, how growth is generated, and B, what is done by the resources generated by economic growth. Now, I began by saying my praise of India with China. Let me give you some numbers, which now would indicate the other side of the story. China has been growing a bit faster than India. A lot of people think that India should try to catch up with China, which I must say, I do want India to catch up with China, but not just growth rate, but on the quality of life and other things. On the other hand, the idea that in order to do that is not to buy cutting on welfare payments and, and the pursuit of capa human capability formation, not only is a mistake, it completely confuses the entire lesson of Asian development, beginning with Japan in the, in the in mid 19th century. Namely, education, healthcare, and expanding productivity of human beings, not only helps human life, which is the primary uh, impact, but it also makes economic growth possible and easier. And China went in that direction, went for universal education straight away, went for universal health coverage, though of not a very good kind initially, even before economic reforms. And it, over the years, there have been ups and downs after the economic reforms. There was a period of some confusion, but the growth has continued, and India has, uh, China has continued to grow faster than India. On the other hand, this has not been the case that this has been achieved by not doing human capability, exactly the opposite. Undernourishment, child undernourishment in India, looking, wait for age, 43.5% of our children are undernourished. The percentage in China, as opposed to 43.4, is 4%, 4 percent, four and a half. The life expectancy, of course, is China is higher, 673 rather than 65. Under five mortality, under five mortality, a bad thing, in India is 63, in China it's 18. I think in, in, in almost anything you look at, there's a major difference. Now, the difference is partly the engagement with these services in, in the nature of economic um, play in the uh, nature of economic policy making. India spent 1.2% of the GDP on public health care. China spends 2.7%, more than twice as much, on governmental health care. A lot of people who are under the impression that our prematurely privatized health care is based on China are not at all. Whatever private health care comes, as in Kerala, comes on the basis of a secure foundation of a public health expenditure that puts health services within easy distance from anywhere. So you, if you see that, and I can give the figures for education for our, all other areas. Jean Dwez and I are finishing a book now on India, which will be published in July, which where we go into all these comparisons within India as well as India and other countries. Um, and the picture is quite sharp. The, if you look at just economic inequality, you'll be somewhat misled because of the fact that the Chinese and Indian economic inequality are not very different in terms of income distribution. It used to be thought that India was much lower, but that isn't quite right, because we compared our expenditure family expenditure inequality with income inequality. Expenditure inequality is well known by any economist who has worked on these empirical things. is always standardly lower than income inequality. But now that we do have income inequality figures, they are roughly the same. On the other hand, the differences are dramatic. Beginning with the most elementary, 48% of the Indian families do not have toilets. This is put sometimes rather in an arcane way, saying they practice open defecation. 
But it isn't the cult that made them practice open defecation. It's not a thought to be a great merit in itself. And indeed, uh, as my colleague Ron Dredd was telling me that, and I was changing the language, and I said, look, how do you know that? He said, oh, because they have no toilet. Therefore, the figure really is toilet. 48%, nearly half the population don't have any toilet. India's undernourishment of children, I've already commented on, is dramatically higher, not only in absolute numbers, despite the fact that China has a larger population, but as a proportion, incomparably different. There's hardly any population which doesn't have a public health care availability, public education facility within reach. It's the lack of the basic amenities of life which make the Indian inequality so extraordinary. It's not the story of the rich and the super rich and the tycoon. But that's a different part of the story, whether you can collect more income from them or not. That's not what angers people, what angers people, and anger that's suppressed because the media is not very friendly to such issues as toilet absent, and in, in a way that much more dramatic issues come into the story a lot more. Uh, it's certainly big um, uh, to talk about the urban deprivation, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, when, when we had a catastrophic organizational failure, and that certainly needs fixing because the Indian public sector requires accountability in a way it doesn't have, and in the infrastructure, physical, not just social, but both requires building. But we have to put them in proportion. The headline said 600 million people plunged in darkness. Well, that's true. But 200 million of them never had any electricity connection anyway. And the country still debates about how it's people friendly to have cheaper electricity while one third of the people have nothing to do with electricity, similarly cooking gas and so on. These are very easy issues to, to um, capitalize on. And on the other hand, the other kind of real deprivation, and you know, I'm absolutely delighted that at long last the issue of violence against women is receiving that kind of attention it has. It, it absolutely. But I would have been even more delighted if it was recognized that Dalit women have been undergoing real violence over a very long time with hardly any protest and any organization behind it. I think there is an absolute uh, gulf in, 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 in that picture. So I think we ought to uh, uh, really look at human development for what it is, um, it, which includes the important contribution of growth. It also points out how growth is achieved, whether to human capability expansion or not, makes a difference. To recognize that human capability expansion is the Asian model of development. To recognize that it's within our powers to to make a big change in that. From time to time, the question has been raised when I, I've sometimes people say I talked about the Kerala model. I've never to uh, <laughs> defy anyone to find a single statement of mine where I quoted Kerala model. I did say there's a lot to learn from Kerala, but in those days I thought Kerala had a lot of bad lessons to offer as well. Uh, and, and you have to take a much more um, uh, positive uh, constructive policy about the market along with the, all the things they were doing. But the total result of it, of course, I was told that this was a flash in the pan. But of course, Kerala's growth rate from being a very low income country state is now one among the very top. And so are the other, other st uh, states which followed routes like that. Tamil Nadu is one example, Himachal is another example. And of course, their achievement he might well have been one of the poorer states, but uh, it has, it's the fact that it overtake others has a lot to do with the Asian model of development, namely the capability-based expansion. Sometimes the comparison is made with uh, Gujarat, which of course had a very distinguished record of, um, of uh, doing 
physical infrastructure well. And from there, there is a lot to learn, undoubtedly. At the same time, if you look at the total result, then you have to see that a lack of interest in human development could make a difference. And made even the difference on per capita income. If you look not just the average income, but the median per capita income, in Gujarat is 6,300, in Tamil Nadu 7,000, Himachal Pradesh 9,942, and Kerala 9,987. If you look at the percentage uh, of the below poverty line 2004-05 scale, in Gujarat is 31.6, Tamil Nadu 29.4, Himachal Pradesh 22.9, Kerala 19.6, all in the income index. But then, but this is not unconnected with the human development, which had been feeding the process. And then if you look at, uh, say, female literacy, Gujarat 63.8, Tamil Nadu 69.4, Himachal 69.5, Kerala 93.0. If you look at the percentage of child um, um, undernourishment, you find similarly uh, a higher picture. And, and also under five mortality, uh, that number is, is quite striking. Gujarat 60.9 under five mortality, as opposed to 60.9, Tamil Nadu 35.5, Himachal 41.5, Kerala 16.3. Um, uh, if you look at present day effort immunization, 45.2% of the population of Gujarat is fully immunized, only 45. In Tamil Nadu, 80.9, Himachal, 74.3, Kerala, 75.3. So I think the, the picture is this, that there is really no conflict between high growth and human development, because human development is not only good in itself, it's one way of achieving growth. And despite the fact that China lacks the kind of multi-party democratic uh, approach that we happen to have, there has been sufficient concern with the lives of the underdogs of society in China um, to make a picture of a kind that puts India quite a bit to shame. Not always. I've also written about the Chinese famine. Recently I've been corrected by a recently published book which said when I estimated that there were 29.6 million people dead in the Chinese famine. They say that I underestimated it. Originally, I was told that I was invented the famine. The first four letters in the New York Review after my article all claimed that had there been such a famine, would we have not known? Uh, of course, the fact is that if you, the famine could survive only because it's not known and not discussed. Now I'm told that I'm wrong because it's 40 million people who died. With whichever the number, there have been periods of great neglect. So there is no kind of um, um, resilience and, 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 and certainty that things will be fine in an autocratic uh, country when, there is, uh, when the democratic system is not functioning. But China, of course, had made a quite a bit of progress in that. I would like it to make more progress. Uh, I, spend, I go to China quite often to find out what's happening. I also chair the uh, International Advisory, um, um, uh, International Adv uh, Advisory Board of the Development Institute of Peking University. And I know that the Indian Chinese intellectuals have been in the forefront of wanting economic reform, not just of the, of the, of the market kind, but also healthcare, also education, also freedom of speech and, and those issues. So this is the really interesting thing to look at. And I think when the post-2014 things come, we have to look at both the mi mi Millennium Development Goals, which of course puts China way ahead of India, uh, as well as the Millennium Declaration and including issues about human rights and so on, which we have to look at. And also the question of how we can combine our democratic system with the kind of commitment that the government, uh, that the government of China has been able to produce in pursuing the interests of the very poor. Uh, the, and here, it's often people say, what would you advise the government to do? 
I don't think it's a question of only advising the government. As a citizen of India, I want to talk to other citizens of India. You know, some of us have maintained the citizens of India, despite a certain amount of inconvenience, standing for two hours at the queue, at entering a country, because every country to which I go, they are absolutely convinced I want to settle there. <laughs> and that's the result of having an Indian passport, but I'm very happy to have that. But I would like to speak to other Indian citizens to talk about the fact that it's what the government is able to do, one, and be not just able, what the government is uh, politically compelled to do depends on what the opposition party does, what the agitations are. If the agitations are all about cheaper electricity for those who have electricity and advantages of the cooking gas for those who have the cooking gas, and, and so on. Uh, then I think the issues of half the population not having toilets and, and in India having the highest undernourishment in the world in terms of child undernourishment will not become a politically engaged issue. I had the opportunity in the December of 2011 in the Indian Economic Association, uh, of which I was very proud that I was involved and I was president of it. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I mentioned that when I became president of the American Economic Association that I learned some of my tricks, some of the ability to deal with it in the context of Indian Economic Association and the same would apply to the Econometric Society and so on. But the, the fact is that I got an opportunity at that time, I think Montek Singh Alu Ali was the president, he asked me to give a talk and I did. And I mentioned about all these scandals and I also pointed out that public resource is a very important thing, but the government had just outlined a plan of food subsidy. And a lot of people said, gosh, this is so fiscally irresponsible. Well, the fact is, the fiscal irresponsibility might be there, but there's so many other items, including a fairly trivial one, no uh, import duty on the import of gold and diamond. That you sacrifice more um, revenue there, even taking into account some of that will be converted into ornaments and sent abroad, even the net figure. And there are several other items like that. Now, uh, it's a question of which one would lead to more agitation. And it was good to that the government would try to do that. And I was very pleased when I was told that in the budget, the government had just introduced a tax on gold. But then, of course, immediately there was treat protest about that, anti-poverty <laughs> of having, so whether led by jewelers or the user, users of jewelry, the government abandoned it. So it's really what you have to address is not just government policy. You have to address opposition policy, opposition and also the responsibility that we as citizens ought to take as to what we put as focus in our in our demands for the government, from the opposition, from the media, from the society. And I think that's where the issue of human development, uh, I think of Mabu Walhak, he would have been delighted to um, think that, uh, that there is a major role for human development in that context. And I'm, of course, delighted that um, uh, since I was associated with him and had a role as Ajay kindly mentioned in the, in the, in the initiation of it, uh, uh, that um, it remains a very important perspective to look at uh, in India today. Thank you very much.